The scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 2, verses 39 through 43 and 46 through 52. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew, became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went out as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know that. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all, things, all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased his wisdom and in years and in divine and in human favor. having a few technical issues that we're trying to resolve, so sorry I'm late getting here for this. Let's pray together. Today, Lord, we come, and as we come, we recognize that once again we seek your presence with us, bring calmness Bring peace to our hearts. Disturb us, Lord, with your word. May it create in us a desire, a desire for more, a desire for you. So help us to hear your word. And as we listen and help us to open our hearts and minds, that the word we hear might be your words and not the word of any man. For we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Today for Dyson Neal is a special day. It's a day when we receive him, to, him into full membership, not only into this faith community, but into full membership in the United Methodist Church and the Universal Church. He began this particular journey 13 years ago on May 20th, 2007, when his parents presented him for baptism. It was a sacred act of promise in which Rick and Amy Neal committed to raising him as a Christian, a disciple, of Jesus Christ. On that day, he, like us, began his training in the business of developing his faith. If we would have been able to confirm him before his birthday in August, he would have been 13, the age of bar mitzvah, time, the time of coming of age when boys, Jewish boys, are recognized as young men. By the way, Bas Victa, Victa is the female. Bar is only for boys. And at that point in their lives, they're expected to take on growing responsibilities of adulthood. The boy is no longer a child, but a youth or better, a young adult in terms of the faith. As a follower of Jesus, Dyson is accepted. Accept 
He's accepted being an apprentice of Jesus, like the rest of us. Now the text this morning shows us Jesus at the age of 12, going on a journey of pilgrimage to Jerusalem that his parents did every year. And as they were returning home, the parents discovered that Jesus was missing. Now they go, uh, before, before, they, before we continue our story, we need to remember the significance of his being 12. In Jewish culture, he's on the verge of manhood. Today, when a Jewish boy reaches 13, he's declared a man and a son of the covenant or a son of the law. At Bar Mitzvah, he's held as, a, it's held as a celebration of this significant step in his life. And afterward, he's expected to, one, keep the law, two, learn a trade, and three, attend a great Jewish feast. Jesus was nearly of that age. To be 12 was to be considered a man. He would take on the responsibilities of early manhood that we might expect out of a boy of that age today. To put matters in perspective, if Jesus had been a girl, he might already be betrothed. In many ways, it was a very different world for men and women. Theologian Dallas Willard helps us understand exactly what that means, what it means to take on the responsibility of a disciple, of an apprentice. He says a disciple or apprentice is simply someone who has decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is. He does this, and how does this apply to Jesus? What is it exactly that he, the incarnate Lord, does? What, if you wish, is he good at? Well, the answer is found in the Gospels. He lives in the kingdom of God. Jesus lives in the kingdom of God. He applies that kingdom for the good of others, and he even makes it possible for them to enter it for themselves. The deeper theological truths about his person and his work do not detract from this simple point. It is what he calls us to do by saying, follow me, follow in his footsteps, become like him, know what he does, know his heart so well that it becomes our heart. Peter, in the book of Acts, gives, uh, gives us the first official presentation of the gospel to the Gentiles. And it provides a sharp picture of the master under whom we serve as an apprentice. He says in Acts 10, 38, you know, and he says it to Cornelius, he says, you know of Jesus, the one from Nazareth, and you know how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and curing all those under oppression by the devil because God was with him. And as a disciple of Jesus, I am with him by choice and by grace, learning from him how to live the, in the kingdom of God. This is the critical idea. This means that we recall how to live within the range of God's effective will, his life flowing through mine. Another important way of putting it is to say that I am learning from Jesus to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. I'm not necessarily learning to do everything he did, but I am learning how to do everything I do in the manner that he did and that he will do. That's what being, a, being an apprentice means. Like Megan, who we confirmed a couple of weeks ago, Dyson was in a confirmation class from, the er from early February into early June. We covered broad sweeps of Bible, theology, and history. We learned about Wesley. We learned about Jesus. We did it together. And at the conclusion, each candidate for membership had to make a choice to continue to membership or not. Choosing to continue means taking on the mantle of an apprentice. 
Jesus in the temple became a model for Christians. Here are some observations. We lose track of Jesus from the time he is returned from Egypt, at age probably three, to this episode in the temple. There's very little in the Gospels about him. There are some what we call apocryphal Gospels that, uh, that refer to him, but they're basically, they've basically been discredited uh, by the early church fathers because they are basically magic. Someplace, Jesus was tutored, we know that. He was tutored as human to understand the scripture. The, our text this morning says he had a great knowledge that impressed those in the temple. Jesus gained understanding of who he was as he was instructed. We don't know who did the instruction. Was it a rabbi? Perhaps in a synagogue that Joseph attended or was a member of? Or was it Mary who nourished him in faith? Well, it really doesn't matter, does it? The point is, how it happened is not nearly as important as what happened. And what happened? His parents, as they stood there at, in the temple, were astonished at his knowledge, at his wisdom, at his maturity. Second thing that happens is Jesus makes a confession about his own faith. He refers to, I have to be about my father's business. Three, Mary treasured all these things in her heart, just like we said a couple of days ago about the shepherds, how Mary treasured them all. She stuck, she tucked them away. She was remembering the visit and the promise of the angel as well. Jesus, at the age of 13, I'm sorry, at the age of 12, not only showed this craving for the divine relationship that would fulfill his destiny and empower his life and ministry, he continued to grow in wisdom and stature and please both God and man. That's what the text tells us. For Jesus maturing in the faith and gaining knowledge of God drives his ministry of risk-taking and challenging unjust established authority. He connected with the needs of those around him. He identified not with aristocrats of the day, but forgotten. The forgotten who bear the burden of poverty, of illness, physical and mental. And he went to be with the people, right among them. Since the beginning of the church, Christians have known that being Christian is a risky business. Being Christian requires risk. Living the faith is a gigantic task. Even today, maybe especially today when the number of professing Christians in our neighborhood is declining and the major majority are either what we refer to as nuns who have never heard the gospel, only about the gospel, and sometimes that's so corrupted, or duns, people who have been uh, been in the church, perhaps raised in the church, and they get to a point in their life where they just reject it all. Being a Christian requires prayer, lots of it. Prayer that can change our lives and change our hearts and help us to better understanding and motivate us into other relationships and other ministries. Being a Christian requires spending time in Scripture, studying it. Well, daily devotionals help. But real study improves our commitment to Christ and to each other. Being Christian requires practicing living my faith in my everyday life. That's really a tough one. There are days when I catch myself and have to ask now, is that the way I'm called to do it? Have I been too harsh with somebody? Have I presented something that was other than the truth? <coughs> Have I been uncaring? And the last piece for a Christian, maybe not the last, but certainly one of the last in this list, is Christians have to be accountable. Not just how I behave, but accountable about my understanding. And the reality is that we backslide. That's been an issue in the church 
almost forever. Not everybody who joined the church, not everybody who joined the movement in the first century stayed. People fall away from their faith. It happens. As a matter of fact, for 50 years after his conversion, John Wesley traveled about 250,000 miles across the country of England. He was preaching that, that we, he, we have records of him reporting that he preached over 40,000 sermons. Now, if you count, that's either one a day for 50 years, pretty close to it, or he preached several times, which he did. He'd preach in the morning and go to a different village sometimes in the afternoon, and then a different one in the evening. The res response to his, uh, to his preaching was both enthusiastic and it was threatening. Not everybody liked what he had to say. His own denomination barred him from preaching in their churches because he insisted on field preaching, that is, going to where the people were. And he had large, large crowds who would follow him. Once he said about his followers, he said, I wonder at those who still talk so loud of the indecency of field preaching. He said, the highest indecency is in St. Paul's Church, when a considerable part of the congregation are asleep, or talking, or looking about, not minding a word the preacher says. I feel a little convicted by that. So those of you who are at home, here's a little word for you. Wake up! Confirmation in reality is only a milepost in our development. It's only a milepost on the journey because every day, every Christian needs to be about the business of making Christ real in life. It's simply not about attending church. That's needed because it's one of the places that our faith should be stretched, challenged, sometimes comforted. It's about growing in Christian wisdom and stature and in favor with God. That's what the disciplines are about. Wesley felt that the greatest threat to the Wesleyan revival were not Wesley's critics, but like today, Wesley's real struggle was with the faithful. He had thousands of converts. As Wesley said one time, Methodists not only believe in backsliding, They practice it maybe better than anybody else. So he formed societies and class meetings and asked people to be accountable to one another for their souls. He tried to create a situation in which somebody would look you in the eye and say, not what's the weather today or who won the ball game, but how is it with your soul? That's what the church is about. Raising the question of how's your soul? Because your soul, what's in you, motivates and, and determines everything that you do beyond that and how you do it. In her book, Traveling Mercies, Anne Lamont shares the story she once heard from her minister that shed some light on the necessary presence of others in our journeys of faith. She said, when my minister was about seven, her best friend got lost one day. The little girl ran up and down the streets of the big town where they lived, but she couldn't find a single landmark. She was frightened, very frightened. Finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of his car and they drove around until she finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman, and then she told him firmly, you can let me out now. This is my church, and I can always find my way home from there. That's part of our journey, always finding our way home. Not necessarily to our physical home, but certainly to our spiritual home. Lamont further writes, and that's why I have stayed so closely to my church, because no matter how bad I'm feeling, 
how lost or lonely or frightened when I see the faces of the people at my church and hear their tawny voices, I can always find my way home. Now, one of the things that Wesley does, and part of the reason he created societies, is he challenges us to reach perfection in love. When I was just a candidate for ministry before I could be ordained, the bishop asked me, as he asked everybody else, or she asked everybody else who's ordained, do you expect to reach perfection in this earthly life? And we all answered we did. Now I have to admit that I was a little immature then than I am now. And I was a little nervous about answering that. But the one thing I know is unless I strive for it and I expect to get there, I never will. That is to say, we set goals beyond what we think we can do because in reality, many times, we grow into them. And if we don't grow into them, we get a lot closer to them than if we didn't set those goals and never try. John Ortberg writes in Leadership Journal, significant human transformation, spiritual formation, if you will, always involves training, not just trying. Spiritual transformation is a long-term endeavor. It involves both God and us. He says, I liken it to crossing an ocean. Some try day after day to be good, to become spiritually mature. That's like taking a rowboat across the ocean. It's exhausting and it's usually unsuccessful. Others have given up trying and throw themselves entirely on relying on God's grace. They're like drifters on a raft. They do nothing but hang on and hope God gets them there. Neither trying nor drifting are effective in bringing about spiritual transformation. A better image is the sailboat, which if it moves at all, is a gift of the wind. We can't control the wind, but a good sailor discerns where the wind is blowing and adjusts the sails accordingly. Working with the Holy Spirit, Jesus is likened to the wind in John 3. It means we have a part in discerning the winds, in knowing the direction we need to go, and in training our sails to catch the breeze that God provides. That's true transformation. Now there are traps along the path of faith and spiritual development which can divert us from a solid faith journey. I remember growing up when, around Christmas time when one of my friends got really angry at Santa Claus. He was from a poorer family. He had asked for a record player. Now, for those of you who are under 60, let me tell you what a record player is. Some people still have 78 records, believe it or not, and 45 records and 33 records. They were flat, they were vinyl. And they were the technology of the day when I was growing up. Well, this young man asked for a record player. His parents were offered one by one of their friends who had a record player that was in great shape, but they were replacing it with something that their child thought was better. It was like new, but it was used. Now think about that for a minute. They took it. They did the best they could, but my friend had a hard time accepting that it was a worthy gift. How could Santa bring him a used, new device? Now 
sometimes our disappointments get our, in our way. And it was in, God in his way of dealing with that gift. Basically put him in a mad, bad mood for several weeks. Parents felt awful because they did what they could do. Those kind of disappointments make us sometimes like that. I know people who are like that. They have a counterfeit understanding of God. They most frequently are angry at God because God didn't give them what they wanted. Like God is some vending machine. You do good deeds, you ask for it, maybe by punching a button and boom, out comes what you ask for. They say, I prayed and, and God didn't answer my prayer. They see God kind of like a spiritual Santa Claus who grants their wishes. And they get angry at God and move away from God when things don't go their way. They don't understand that God is more than a wish granting, a great wish granter. We are part of God's creation. We serve him. He supports us. When life doesn't go as we want them to, we can't really get angry and feel that God let me down or doesn't do anything for me. I've heard that. But that kind of attitude really does block our ability to relate to God and to deal with others. We serve God. He is not servant to us. He loves us and he cares for us and wants the best for us. But sometimes that best is helping us get through it, get through the terrible things that life hands us. Good spiritual formation really takes place when it happens with a mentor or a coach. Dyson, I know, is an avid football player. Not football, baseball. I know that. We talked about that a lot of times. Belongs to two, uh, to two teams. Uh, I understand, Rick, that you're the coach. Just a little bit. No, just, okay, not, not his coach anymore. But you know, we depend on the coach to help us to help, help us see what we can't see ourselves, that maybe there's a technique that's wrong. Maybe our heart isn't in it. <laughs> I was never a great sports player. My oldest son isn't either. I remember him playing t-ball. The ball could hit him on the head and he couldn't find it. Well, that's not all where all of us are. But a coach, a mentor, or a group as, as a mentor, playing that role as mentor or coach. They help us. Something takes place when we hear them, when, we, when, when, they, when they address us. And then too, quietness and listening helps get in touch with what God is saying to me or my, the development of my spiritual formation. That point, see, even what, 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 what most people might take a vow of silence. Even when they're in a silent community, they have support and direction. They may not be able to talk to each other, except for maybe a couple of minutes a day. But they still have a spiritual advisor, a mentor. Now the reality is that I understand how scary these relationships are. Because support and accountability go hand in hand. But the reality is we have work to do. And we have to work at training. But even in the secular world, having someone who can help you learn and develop, regardless of age or training, really doesn't happen in solitude. Maturity doesn't happen in solitude. If we expect our faith and our spiritual life to mature, we need help. Our faith is a community effort. And we grow together as we at every age explore God's word, pray and serve, or live out our faith in God's world. So to all of us today, 
Grow in your faith. Live it out in community.